I think it was a part, something for all of us. I can't speak for anyone except myself, but I think it's something that uh, uh, affects us all in terms of our own personal maturity, especially at a young age. And uh, uh, it sort of stays with you always. I was a navigator on a B-52 from 70 to 73. By 1972, October, most of our ground forces had been removed from South Vietnam. The North Vietnamese communists took advantage of our withdrawal and began to mass their troops next door in neighboring Laos and Cambodia in preparation for a full-scale invasion of South Vietnam. The Paris peace negotiations were still going on at that time, and our country's administration, President Nixon, uh, through our representatives there, let it be known to the North Vietnamese, uh, withdraw your forces now or we will not only resume uh, air combat operations in the south, but for the first time we will begin strategic bombing of targets in and around your capital of Hanoi and the large port of Hai Phong about 70 miles to the east. And we will use B-52s to do that. That was, that was communicated to the North Vietnamese. They not only did not heed the warning and remove their troops, but they walked out of the peace negotiations on the 13th of December. The very next day, President Nixon directed that strategic bombing of the North begin. The name of it was called Linebacker II, and uh, that uh, was the very end of the war. Uh, our crew was there at that time. Uh, that was our first, our fourth, and last one, and we were quite concerned when we went over to pre-mission briefing that day because there was a growing feeling within the crew force that the losses, the 13 B-52s that had gone down in the first seven days, were the result of faulty tactics being directed in the mission plans uh, up there. And uh, we were concerned it was going to happen again. As soon as we got into pre-mission briefing, it became clear that this was the first day of new tactics with the hope of uh, keeping our casualties down. Uh, we were still concerned about going, but on the other hand, we thought we had a chance to maybe uh, get through the thing. Basically what it amounted to was there'd be no more three attacks during the day with large periods of time in between the waves and let the enemy reload their, their defenses and things. Instead, there would be one large attack on the 26th. It would consist of 120 aircraft B-52s uh, divided into seven waves. Each one of the waves would have between five and seven three-ship cells. All the attack would happen within the same 15-minute period. All of the ordnance carried by all 120 aircraft consisting, that meant 8,000 bombs, would be delivered to the same 10 targets within 15 minutes. And the idea was there were threefold, to completely overwhelm the North Vietnamese air defenses, to uh, uh, completely eradicate or eliminate the, the assigned targets, and to convince the leadership to come back to the negotiating table. At the Conclusion of that 11 day period on the 29th, though, with their infrastructure of uh, their nation completely uh, devastated, uh, their air defenses just demolished, and their cities vulnerable to further attack by us, the North Vietnamese sent a signal to President Nixon saying, We'd like a ceasefire. He immediately uh, directed a bombing halt, even as the last bombers were returning on the 29th. Uh, two days later, they came back to the peace negotiations. The end of January, they signed the peace accord. Uh, we began a 60-day period to remove all of our forces from South Vietnam. All of our 560 prisoners of war came back that they were holding in Hanoi. But it was very costly. Uh, during that uh, 11 days, we had uh, uh, 729 individual B-52 sorties flown against Hanoi and Haiphong. Uh, the North Vietnamese launched more than 1,200 surface-to-air missiles. They connected with 25 airplanes. 15 actually went down and resulted in 33 uh, more POWs. 21 of our people actually got rescued and 55 were killed. So uh, that was a pretty big price to pay, but they did come back to negotiation and we had the results that we said. Everyone handles it in a different way. The first thing, you, first concern you have is taking care of each other. Emotionally, you stuff it until you get back. Uh, because you, the thing that really keeps you strong is your checklist. Maybe other people could relax for a while, but I was navigating. And the most important thing because of everything I described was timing. You had to be uh, absolutely on time because of the support people doing what they were in and out of the target area. So you had to be on, not plus or minus a couple minutes, you had to be on time. So from a navigational perspective, that was a challenge. 
we were doing what we were doing and we, we felt uh, a little let down by the folks who were protesting and, and so forth. Uh, they have the right to do that, but it, it really sort of, uh, after we had just been through what we were through, and, and four hours later you take a shower and go over to have a, something to eat, and the television's on, and, and you see what's going on, you become a little upset. Uh, I was uh, pretty much uh, rightist in my views, and uh, I didn't have too much sympathy for those who didn't want to defend the country. and. And I thought, and I still do think, it's perfectly fine to help a country uh, resist being taken over by an oppressive force. And that's what was going on in South Vietnam. I was uh, pretty unknowledgeable and maybe a little naive at the time about political things. But from a military perspective, there was no doubt in my mind that uh, it was a good thing that our country was helping South Vietnam. And so I felt good about uh, that. It, it changed me because I really learned how insignificant I was uh, and uh, I, I didn't get a vote to whether I liked that feeling or not. It, it was there. No one can experience that in whatever form they experience that in without being humbled a little bit and uh, I needed that. 